Simple and to the point, we are so close to the Raptor season at this stage that it is time to make some bold predictions about the upcoming season. It's JJ Buckets, everybody, and before I start, just make sure you're hitting that like button. It really helps with the algorithm. I really appreciate it. And if you're new here and you enjoy what you watch today, just make sure you subscribe to the channel. With all that being said, let's hop into the video. Now, before I start with the first one, just again, a reminder, these are bold predictions, so I'm sure there is a fairly good chance that I can look back at these in a year, much like you can look back at these in a year and laugh, being like, what the hell was he thinking? That being said, I tried to ground these bold predictions within at least the realm of logic and possibility, so take that for what you will, I guess. First bold prediction, the Toronto Raptors are going to take a top three seed in the Eastern Conference this season. There's a few reasons I like this one, and I'm going to give a shout out to I forget his full Twitter handle, but S on Raptors Twitter, who made a very good point about the outlook of the Eastern Conference this year and why it may actually favor the Raptors. So obviously the Eastern Conference is packed with good teams this year. It is absolutely packed. Nobody's going to deny that. And the competition is certainly going to be there. However, there are at least a few things working in the Raptors' favor. The major one being that a lot of these teams, there's going to be a lot of new integration, there's going to be a lot of things that they need to figure out because of all these moving parts. I mean, part of the reason why the Eastern Conference is so good this season is because moves are made, new faces are going to be in new places. You know, Donovan Mitchell in Cleveland, even though, and even though like the move happened last season, for example, Ben Simmons in um, Brooklyn, excuse me, DeJounte Murray in Atlanta, so on and so forth, you get the idea. So one of the things that I, believe really does favor the Raptors here is they have continuity. They've really tinkered with the roster like a little bit, but nothing major, like the core pieces are all still the same, the big players are all still the same. Obviously you may be playing around with the roles a little bit in terms of what you're going to be doing this offseason. Ah, excuse me again. And that will actually be an interesting part of a few upcoming things uh, that I say in this video as well. But nonetheless, the Raptors have their continuity, they have their identity figured out, and in a conference where so many moving parts are you know, being integrated, that's really gonna go in their favor, on top of which there's a couple of other X factors for why the Raptors could legitimately secure a top seed here. Uh, big one, for example, off the top of my head, Milwaukee Bucks I don't think really care about the regular season. Obviously, when it comes to championship contenders, they'd be right at the top of the list, but are they really gonna give it their all in the regular season? I don't think so, quite frankly. Boston without Ime is going to be really interesting. Obviously, the whole scandal happened, and not a lot of people have, I think, fully talked about how that may affect the Celtics. Maybe they're still just as good as last season. Maybe they're even better, but maybe that could be a painful loss, especially you know for the actual regular season itself, which again is where this prediction lies. On top of which, you know, Miami is a little bit of an older team, a little bit aging out. Does that affect them in the regular season and how hard they want to push themselves? You know, with guys like Jimmy Butler getting up there in age, obviously Kyle Lowry did not have a full bill of health last season, etc., etc. Like Cleveland, which is obviously a team that a lot of people are excited about, has a lot of things to figure out with Donovan Mitchell. I could keep going. Like, you get the idea here that there are a lot of things, question marks, up in the air, and the Raptors just aren't one of those teams that have question marks, and we know they're a damn good team, so as far as the regular season goes, I think securing a top three seed isn't the tallest task, quite frankly, for the Raptors, and by season's end, they could very well be there. One of the reasons I actually feel fairly confident about that first prediction is kind of because of the second prediction here, and that is Scotty Barnes will be an NBA All-Star this season. Now, I think it's safe to say that most people are expecting Scotty Barnes to have a, you know, reasonable jump in his production, reasonable jump in who he is as a player, and just some steady improvements. But I do think fully going out there and saying he will be an all-star, considering the talent pool in the East, is a fairly confident or a fairly bold prediction that comes with some confidence, rather. There's a couple of reasons I do like it, though. Number one is such a weird and arbitrary thing, but it's Genuinely because the NBA is weird with where they put certain players on the all-star ballot like last season You had DeMar DeRozan listed as a guard you had I believe it was Jimmy Butler was the other one that was listed as a guard Or I may be confusing the second one But DeMar was the big one that I remember standing out where 
these players weren't playing as guards uh, during that season, they were playing as forwards, but the NBA still listed them as guards. You get the idea, right? Like, in theory, Scotty will have five forward spots that he can fill and two more flex spots past that, so there is some room for him to make it, and I do think he will make it. I expect the Raptors to give plenty of opportunity to Barnes in this upcoming season, which is one of the reasons why I believe he can be an all-star, because I think there will be healthy, and I, genuinely, I mean, healthy uptick in his production. The big thing, obviously, is I think Barnes will receive ample opportunity to be a playmaker for this team. There's been talk from Nurse about using you know, Fred Van Vliet off ball more, at which point I think you're gonna be putting the ball in Scotty Barnes's hands a lot more and letting him work as a playmaker. And hopefully that will contribute to improving some other areas of his game that need it, like the big one obviously being his scoring realistically. Scotty Barnes, when it comes to the advanced numbers, was not a good scorer. His points per play, I think overall, according to Cleaning the Glass, was actually really bad. Um, he ranked in the 22nd percentile and in particular obviously a lot of the talk with the Raptors has been that they need help in the half court. I think that's a regular theme amongst the Raptors and Scotty Barnes was equally bad there if I'm not mistaken. He was either the 42nd or the 44th percentile when it came to on-off numbers with points per possession in the half court. It was bad. <laughs> it was bad. Uh, <laughs> So the idea there, hopefully, is with these ample opportunities to serve as a playmaker, where I do think he is a fairly equipped player and a fairly talented player, that playmaking then goes to open up more scoring opportunities because of the threat of the playmaking, and that's where Barnes has a chance to shine, has a chance to see improvements all across the board in his game. So much so where hopefully, you know, in particular, again, the half-court scoring is something that I really would like to see as an improvement from Barnes. Actually, once again, if you're looking at cleaning the glass, Scotty Barnes was actually off the court when the Raptors had their most effective uh, lineup when it came to the half-court. It was actually Ken Birch coming at center and Scotty Barnes coming off where the Raptors saw their most effective lineup. Now, actually, past that, <laughs> most of the Raptors lineups uh, from there do include Barnes in terms of effectiveness, but if you look at how effective they are, it's not very. <laughs> so again, you'd like to see the improvements in the half court. You'd like to just see the improvements across the board when it comes to scoring. And I do think he has that chance with an added focus to playing a role, ironically, as a playmaker, which should open up scoring opportunities from him. All a long way of saying, there will be a jump across the board from Scotty Barnes, and I'd like to think it will be a strong enough jump across the board where he will actually be an NBA All-Star this season. Now, this third one might actually contradict the first one a little bit in terms of the talks of continuity, but I do think it's an interesting situation to pay attention to because it could very much so be real. I do think the Raptors are going to be in on any big name trade talks throughout the season and closer up to the trade deadline for a few reasons here. So obviously we've already heard the talk of the Raptors monitoring the SGA situation, which I think that is the most seamless and natural fit when it comes to these trade talks. Obviously SGA is Canadian, SGA loves Toronto, at least from everything he posts on his IG, he misses home. The Thunder situation is unfavorable in terms of the constant tanking. SGA is a player that is way too good to be a part of that constant tanking, despite some of the talk that he may be happy, he may be content. There's a reason you're monitoring that situation, right? <laughs> Here's the thing though. The big reason why I do believe the Raptors are going to be players potentially at this trade deadline, or at least in some capacity throughout the season, especially for these bigger names, is there is going to be a lot of contracts and players coming off the books over these next few seasons. Just at the end of the season alone, Fred Van Vliet and Gary Trent Jr. both have player options that they can decline, at which point, you know, obviously, you gotta bring out the uh, Brinks truck, so to speak, I believe. OG Anobi has a player option he can decline at the end of next season, and guys in general just have expiring player contracts. I believe Precious Chua is amongst that group as well that will need to get paid. Basically, long way of saying a lot of people are gonna need to be paid 
in the near upcoming future. So as much as you feel like, you know, you have stability with this core, as much as you feel like you have a good thing going forward, reality is the clock is kind of ticking on this specific collection and group of players. At which point, you got to start making decisions, right? Like you don't want to lose these guys for nothing. And realistically speaking, as much as you'd like to think you could pay everybody based on, you know, some of the market out there for players that we've seen, there's a good chance you won't be able to pay everybody. Look at by comparison, Tyler Hero, right? Tyler Hero just got the bag thrown at him from the Miami Heat. And, you know, as much as you could definitely argue that Tyler Hero is a bigger name, so to speak, and has more of that name notoriety across the league than somebody like Gary Trent Jr. If you're looking at the numbers, there's not a massive disparity in those numbers between a Gary Trent Jr. and a Tyler Hero, at which point, again, you gotta sit down and you gotta think to yourself, well, Gary Trent Jr. has a player option at the end of the season. Gary Trent Jr. might want to opt out of it to take a payday. Are the Raptors going to pay him? Because if they're paying him, do they also have the money to pay Fred Van Vliet, who can also do the exact same thing? And you could argue took a bit of a pay cut the last time that he did sign with the Raptors. Reportedly, at least teams like the Knicks had bigger contracts on, on the board for Fred Van Vliet. And to some extent, you know what? You could sit there and you could say, you know what? Maybe all of these guys, all of these guys really love Toronto and maybe they are willing to take some sort of hometown discounts but at the same time you also sit there and you think to yourself okay well then at that point is this core strong enough to compete for a championship you know with everybody staying intact which is a conversation for another day and an argument for another day but I mean mmm mm, it's an argument I'm really tempted to get into now but then in this video will just last too long the thing is though, like locking in all those guys to the contracts that they can arguably get or should reasonably command, I really don't believe is a feasible task for the Toronto Raptors, which is why I do genuinely believe if there's a name that comes available that's big enough, you know, SGA, hell, like if the Chicago Bulls decide to blow it up because they realize they're not good enough with this current team, which, spoiler, they're not good enough with this current team. <laughs> Guys are going to be available, guys that can improve your team, and you got to start looking at those names, right? You got to start looking at those teams, you got to start monitoring those situations, because as much as you do hate to say it, and genuinely, I will say it one more time, I do think the clock is quietly ticking on this core that they have together here. So what do you folks think? Which one of these predictions is the most outlandish? Comment below and let me know, and if you have any bold predictions of your own, drop them in the comment section as well. It's been JJ Buckets, one more time for the usual drill. Like the video, it goes a long way, and I really do appreciate it. I know it doesn't sound like I do because I say the same thing all the time, but I really do, I really do. And if you're new here and you like what you watch today, subscribe to the channel. Plenty of new content on the way. I have so many video ideas coming up and I look forward to dropping all of them, so make sure you stick around for that. Other than that, it's been a pleasure, and I will see everybody next time.